it's kind of funny. I have to think all the way back to, uh, you know, uh, back in 2009, I was actually, you know, I was, I was 12 years old at the time. I'm 25 now. It's like 13 years ago. And I started out with a YouTube channel, AppFind, where I was reviewing mobile apps, technology tutorials. Um, I've always kind of had that entrepreneurial spark. So kind of before that, I mean, I had the, the classic kind of quintessential, you know, lemonade stand <laughs> story. So I was selling, uh, you know, different different things at lemonade stands. And I had this, I remember I had this lemonade stand and I was, you know, making fresh squeezed lemonade. I was selling it, you know, 75 cents, cookies for 50 cents, both for a dollar. I had my regular customers. They were, you know, stopping by my, my spot, you know, as, as they were walking down to the, you know, swim and tennis club. And I think an earlier spark of just, you know, really when I realized I loved entrepreneurship and also marketing, um, an early story, I don't always, always tell this, but I think you, you mentioned what was you know, a spark, right? I remember, um, you know, thinking, well, wait a second, in the summer, all of these people, and this was, this was actually more when I was like, you know, eight, nine, 10, I was doing this lemonade stand, right? And I was thinking, well, all these people would walk down, they'd go to the swim and tennis club, and they'd, or they'd get my lemonade and I would sell that, you know, over the summer and I do really well. But when the summer ended, well, where, where are people going? Um, they're not really going to swim as much anymore. Some people were going to play tennis and I still wanted to sell on the weekends. So I think my earliest foray into marketing was asking myself, where are the people going? And um, again, my job was like, eight, you know, eight or nine at the time. And I was, and I was realized, well, where do people go in the fall? They go to yard sales on the weekends. And especially back then, right? And so I opened up the newspaper. I found the yard sales in the area. And I literally went and knocked on doors. And I said, hey, can I sell my lemonade at your yard stand? People will stay longer. And I have my pitch down and all this stuff. And and I would go there. And I realized I was going where the people were. And I think that was my earliest, like, real foray into, like, loving marketing was going where the people are and figuring out what my offer was, what's going to get them to stay. And... Um, you know, and I don't, I don't know if you have it. I'm sure you can think back to yourself and a lot of listeners, you know, listening or watching right now could probably think back to their, the early days, you know, and, and, and that's probably my earliest kind of, you know, spark. But basically when I was, when I was 12, I was looking for something to do over the summer and uh, beyond just the lemonade stand. And I was so excited about YouTube. I was watching YouTube. I was like really consumed with YouTube in the early days. Um, as I'm sure people can remember, like I used to upload videos. I was you know, taught myself how to edit. I had a video camera when I was when I was really young. I used to upload all these videos on YouTube. Um, and I remember just on a whim, I uploaded on my my kind of fun channel, my personal channel, or whatever, um, a video reviewing a mobile app because I just gotten you know the the iPhone at the time, like, you know, first generation. I was showcasing an app that I liked. And all of a sudden, people were watching. I said, wait a second, people are watching this. This is so cool. So I created a new channel called AppFind. And then more and more people started watching it. More and more people started watching the channel. And then that started growing. So and then tens of thousands of people, then hundreds of thousands. Then all of a sudden, millions of people were watching. Um, and I remember when I was in high school, I got the 100,000 subscriber you know, award. I was getting all of these different sponsorships. Um, you know, I started, you know, by the tail end of, of high school, I started making you know six figures a year and then going into college from my YouTube channel. Um, and, and I use that to pay for college. And the great part is, especially with, you know, when you talk about financial independence and those types of things, you know, I actually have set up the YouTube channel and we're gonna talk more about YouTube ads, ad outreach, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've got questions around that and, and, and the main business now, but I set up that YouTube channel as the first real business that I had um, I read the four hour work week, you know, Tim Ferriss, obviously I'm sure a lot of people, you know, shout him out here on the podcast, different pot, you know, everything. Uh, but I read that systematized the business, hired script writers, video editors, you know, all the people that I needed. And then from there, um, I pulled myself out. So I was really only doing like an hour a week on AppFind to this day. Uh, I've got different people that do it, a different person who's the face of the channel now. And that still earns me between 10 to $15,000 a month in profit. And that's enough to pay all my living expenses, all the all the stuff that I need. Um, it still pays all of that from that YouTube channel that now I spend an hour a week doing. And that's given me the freedom to pursue my main business ad outreach, reinvest a lot back into it, you know, scale that business to eight figures. Um, and, and and that's kind of where the early spark came from. And happy to dive into ad outreach and or answer any questions around that, too. Yeah, I was about to say, like taking a deeper look at that, you're 12 years old, you're starting this YouTube channel that has turned into this thing that still this day is able to fund your whole lifestyle. 
what kind of like what was like your equipment stack what was how were your parents involved like what was going on when this really first kicked off that is a great question and so one of the big things that i say too and, and i'm a huge advocate and proponent for this and i this is what i'll do you know in the future um you know i'm always off from this but you know when i have a family of my own and stuff my parents really raised me really well with you know everything that i had i had to you know make sure that i worked for and i understood the value so even the lemonade stand I was taught the value of profit. And I actually really love this. I'm a big advocate for this, not just to fund, you know, uh, your kids or kids, you know, lemonade stand, but to say, listen, there's like, we're going to take the expenses out of this and you're going to get to keep what the actual profit is. I was taught what actual profit was because I had to pay for all my own supplies um, for those lemonade stands, or at least take it out of, you know, it's kind of maybe, maybe there's like a, a, you know, interest-free loan attached to that. But like on the back end, I would have to pay and I would only get to keep what my actual profits were at the end of the day. So I learned that, um, you know, at an early age. And then also all the different things, like my, I had a, I had a Sony Handycam. That was the early one that I had. And that was like a birthday present. I had the Adobe Creative Suite, all the disc, like the gigantic disc set. That was like a Christmas gift. Um, and so I had these different things. Uh, and what I would always, you know, ask for for gifts and then what I would use my like lemonade stand money for, and then later my app find money for, was just to buy more things for the business. But the early tech stack, it was hilarious. Um, it, I had the, the, and it wasn't even technically an iPhone, it was an iPod Touch, right? It was like the first generation iPod Touch. I had my Sony Handycam on a tripod facing down at a piano bench. That was my background. And then I was filming the video. And then, you know, again, I, I did have Adobe Premiere, which I was, you know, uh, lucky to have it, although, you know, I got that as a, a gift as well. I had taught myself how to edit that. And that was the tech stack for, for the YouTube channel for those early days, creating that, um, you know, teaching myself how to do it. And it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of fun. So I think this next question always produces an interesting answer. For someone who finds entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial success so young, you said at the end of high school, you're making six figures with that find. Why college? Like, why did you feel the need to get the college degree in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I made a specific choice to, to continue to go to, to, to go to college and actually, you know, graduate, you know, go, go through go through college. I kind of graduated a little early, but go through my, you know, uh, three, three and a half years that, that I uh, that I was there to get my degree. And the reason that I went there was because I wanted to be surrounded with other people and network and meet other people because I was really, you know, more in a solo entrepreneurship journey. And so when I went to, uh, you know, UMass Amherst and Eisenberg and actually Cody, we, we went there together, you know, at the same, <laughs> the, you know, as, together as well. I know represent some <laughs> stuff. exactly, exactly at UMass. And so we were talking about that a little bit earlier on. Um, but the reason I chose to go there um, and, and there were a bunch of different colleges is I remember meeting with Burton, who was the entrepreneur, uh, kind of professor, but also kind of faculty advisor for the entrepreneurship, uh, you know, perfume center for entrepreneurship. And I remember meeting with him and some of the other colleges, they were excited for the wrong reasons about what I had, uh, you know, had created about with that fun, like other colleges. And I'll give you, well, I don't know if I, sorry, not try to, not try to call these colleges out. So I won't guess they're good, but big name colleges that you'd know of, I decided not to go to um, because they said, oh, this is great. Even colleges that pride themselves in entrepreneurship, private colleges, more expensive. They're like, this is great to get you in the door, but we're going to teach you how to build a real business. They didn't understand that YouTube was a real business, that I was making real money on this versus when I went to UMass Amherst, I went to Eisenberg and I talked to Burton. Um, you know, and, 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 and I definitely owe a lot to, to him as well, especially, you know, championing me throughout, throughout my time there. Um, you know, when I went there and I talked to him before making that decision, he said, I want to empower you to do more with this business, to build your next business and in college. And that's what I loved. And I, you know, I joined the entrepreneurship club became like their marketing director before I even stepped foot on. I, I, I ran for that like before the, 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 the college year even started, I became the president of the entrepreneurship club my freshman year and also scaled that as well. That's like a legacy that I'm proud to have left on, uh, you know, on UMass and uh, alma mater. They still run some of the events we set up. We grew the club from like a dozen, two dozen people to over 150 people. It's still going strong to this day. I actually now make donations to it, which is great. Although now I get blown up all the time by, by UMass. I'm not, I don't know if you know that. <laughs> you're, you're the same oh stuff, yeah. The same letters. But <laughs> exactly. You get, you get a lot of the letters, 
But uh, but it's honestly great to see that, and that's that's the reason I decided to do it. The entrepreneurship, the classes themselves, with a few exceptions, that wasn't the really the main reason. Uh, it was valuable valuable to get other business advice. I think the big thing though that I would say is absolutely the network, the people that were there, the entrepreneurship. Um, the entrepreneurship club was the highlight of uh, of my college career, and um, that I think is the big thing. And I, I had foreseen that type of thing. I wanted to go to a place that I knew could champion me and I could continue to focus on my business. And I still did put my business first above uh, college and the classes. It's just I also wanted to have that be a second priority while I was there. You know, this randomly maybe I'll, I'll explain, but made me think about like the way I think about LeBron James. And one thing that's so impressive to me is that you handed this 18 year old this much money and he still kept like a level head on his shoulders. He didn't get into trouble. He made good business decisions. And like you said, you're making real money. Like you're making real money. You're making six figures as a high schooler. You know, I don't know that if I would have had six figures coming in as a, a college freshman that I'd been making the best decisions. So like when you see that much money coming in, I guess, did that like did you have a period, like a learning curve where you started just blowing money on crazy stuff and had to take a step back and I'm like all right I can't do this or were you just like you know very strict with it the whole way through and have just done a you know incredibly like professional and responsible job the whole way through Yeah so that's a great question so I was very strict with it and I actually think almost too strict that I had to learn other things as well because yeah and even with like where you say too having more money and like you know, blowing it and doing different things. I think when I went to college, especially my freshman year, I was almost too like straight laced and too like, I'm gonna just grind on business such that like earlier on in college, definitely the first two years, if not, you know, well, really the first like two and a half years. And then I kind of had, you know, that, um, you know, final kind of junior and senior year was kind of mixed for me just because of the way that I, you know, uh, accelerated things. But, um, the first like two and a half years of college, I was very, very dedicated, very focused, working super late nights, working all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I really didn't, you know, I didn't really, you know, drink until the tail end of college and stuff like that. So I wasn't going to parties, wasn't doing those types of things. I was very focused. I was focused on the business, entrepreneurship club, and then my college classes slash grades. Those were like the three top priorities. So, you know, business, uh, entrepreneurship club and, and then the actual classes and grades and stuff. And so the, the, the socialization, all that. So I actually think it's something that I had to learn to kind of stop and smell the roses and to have fun. And it's not bad to have, you, you know, to go to a event or to celebrate or to have a good time, have a fun time. Um, you know, when I, uh, you know, later in college, I actually had more my, my kind of final year that I had there. I had more of an experience in, in college. Um, well, still balancing and still doing more business, but also going out you know, especially when I was 21, I can go to the bars and do different things like that. Um, but I think that uh, it's really interesting because I think people have different views. And so they either go one or one or two directions. Uh, they either kind of go that crazy direction or they go very, very straight laced. Like, I'm just going to grind, 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 kind of the Gary Vee hustle mentality, uh, which obviously was, you know, very, very following very, Gary Vee very closely then too. Um, but I think that people kind of work themselves back into a nice equilibrium that's going to work well for them long term. So just to give the listeners some context into my next question, I taught this OIM 210, it was Operation Information Management class. I was a TA. I had like a 50-minute session every single week. And that's actually where I met Alaric. He was one of my students in my class. And so, man, how often were you actually doing the work in the class? And how often were you working on your businesses? <laughs> now that I have an insight into... Uh... <laughs> well, that is honestly actually a really great question because I say I had those three priorities, but I go, I go all out. And um, I will say that uh, in my entire college that I had, I probably, and it, like there was only ever one class that I actually purposely skipped where I wasn't like sick or actually at like an event or something like that, like a business thing. Um, and uh, there were some, some other details there. I didn't really agree with the professor what they were doing. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I probably shouldn't have done that, but whatever. Um, but there was really only one class that I ever actually like actively did not like put my all in. And it's because I didn't respect the professor. The professor, I, to I told them that I have a business event. Like I was going to go to a, a mastermind, a business event, a mastermind out in San Diego. And um, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't, it wasn't like a speaker, but I was gonna present there and I was gonna be with other business owners. And it was like an important, like, you know, mastermind event. And um, all the other professors I had were like, oh, this is amazing. This is great. Like they gave me the thumbs up. 
And then that one professor said, if you don't come and take the test that week, I'm going to fail you for the entire class. And, um, and I, I just really, and, and then, and then I had to go over his head again, like shout out to, to Burton, the professor that I you know, had, um, he, he actually wrote a letter and like faculty, you know, uh, sanctioned the whole thing, uh, the whole, uh, the whole event. So like it, it, there was nothing that he could do. He had to, uh, reluctantly let me take the test and, you know, I aced that test cause you know, I'm going to show up, like do, do good work on the test. So he had to you know, pass me for that class, but that was really the only class where after that point, I didn't really respect the professor as much and who knows, I, I don't know. So I just, you know, that's where, that's where maybe I didn't show up as, as much, but I think that the other, every other class that I did, I, um, you know, I, I went all out. So at what point did you go from, just focusing on app finder to, to growing out and, and branching out. And I guess, how did you select what you're going to do next? Or was it always kind of obvious to you where you would go after you decided to take, you know, add additional things to your plate other than just app finder? Yeah, that's a great, that is a great question. So honestly, um, you know, that was the big thing I was looking for because again, in college, my freshman year and my, and my, the beginning of my sophomore year, was all about systematizing app find. So when you knew me there, uh, if that was my, my sophomore year, it sounds like in the, the OIM class, right? Um, you know, that year was, that was the transition year. So I was really focused on transitioning over app find. And so what happened was my freshman year, um, I started hiring video editors, script writers, having people kind of start taking over the YouTube channel. I read four hour work week. I started going through that process. And I had one particular social media networking app. And um, this, this social media networking app they had hired a performance marketing company, which today would probably be called an influencer marketing company, but it wasn't really a word back then, you know, like, you know, like uh, seven ish years ago, seven, eight years ago, whatever it was. Um, but basically at the beginning of my freshman year, I had that particular app um, pay that company. They had me do a video. I published the video. They get a bunch of downloads. They say, this is great. Can you post the video again tomorrow? And so I take that, uh, so, so I say like, well, wait a second, like, we can't just take that video and post it the next day and get, you know, the same results. Like if they got a thousand users, they're not going to get like another thousand just by me posting it the next day because it's the same people have already seen it. But I said, what if we run this video as an ad to reach even more people that are similar to those that have already seen that um, video? And they said, well, that, that would be great. But how do you do that? And I said, so, well, well, I've been experimenting with YouTube ads and I had just done a little bit there. I was experimenting with YouTube ads. I said, what if we run a YouTube ad for this? So they're a little reluctant. They only give me $500 to test this out. But in, for $500 in one week, we get over 11,000 users for their app. Wow. <laughs> blown away. They said, wow, this is, you know, is better than any other promotion campaign that they are running. The highest, uh, you know, return. And so we keep running that. They're like, all right, how much can more can we scale it? So we, you know, we scaled that, continue running that for a while. Um, then the performance marketing company said, hey, we've got another app. And this is a big app. And so that app had me do a promotion. The second app I was, I was working with, I was spending thousands of dollars a day in ad budget for them. As the second business I ever ran YouTube ads for. And I was just learning on the fly. I was diving in. And I was also teaching myself. I wasn't, there wasn't guides because YouTube ads were so early back then. I was just figuring it out as I went testing things, doing a ton of different campaigns, like going in and, and just being a self-starter. And um, so I, I started doing that. And that company actually later became, and, and I'm not taking credit for this because they had a ton of other marketing channels, but uh, that company became like a unicorn later on, like that that company that was at the second app. And then, um, and I can't you know disclose the specific, but it was, it was pretty cool. And, and then um, the, the performance marketing company uh, they reached it back out to me and they said, listen, these, this promotion, this promotion, these are all so great. And there was, I think, one other promotion. Um, we want you to drop out of college, fly out here to Silicon Valley, join our company. You can head up the YouTube ads division. They're like, we're all, you know, 20, uh, you know, something year olds. Like, you're going to fit right in. Um, and it was tempting for a second, but I turned it down because I wanted to be like, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast, or watching this podcast resonate with i'm sure both of you resonate with i want to be the king of my own castle i wanted to create my own empire as opposed to being the knight in somebody else's i wanted to forge my own path so i turned it down and there are other two offers i turned those down as well and then i said you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna go and i'm gonna build this i'm gonna build this uh myself and um i originally it was uh you know youtube ads for mobile apps it was originally like app outreach 
um, which is what you may have known depending on when that OAM class was, because that was around when I was creating that, um, it, you know, uh, the app outreach side. Um, then, I, so I was running that. I was getting, working with app developers, worked with dozens of app developers, drove millions of app install downloads. We were in the early beta programs of, you know, we were, I was working with like two, three Google, like marketing, um, like directors in, uh, you, you know, where, like wherever in, in California um, that were calling in to see what we were doing with YouTube ads for mobile app installs because it was so cutting edge at the time, which was great. So I, I remember this, like we were, we were meeting with them every single week. And, um, and, and by we, I mean like me and like I had hired a couple other people to like help me with this project. Um, some of which are actually still with us today, which is amazing. Um, but then from there, uh, it, 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 it the, the, the pivot happened when I went to HubSpot Inbound 2016 out there in you know, Cambridge in Massachusetts. And I went out to HubSpot Inbound and I remember seeing um, the ClickFunnels booth. And that's when I realized, wait a second, I can do what I'm doing for apps, but for online businesses actually selling products, services, courses, coaching, consulting, all of these different things. That's when I dove in and I was now doing YouTube ads for funnels. I joined a mastermind, um, you know, my, my sophomore year of college, I, I remember joining a mastermind, a uh, high ticket mastermind. I joined that. I went in, I learned how to build funnels and I was doing YouTube ads for funnels. Everybody else in the mastermind was Facebook ads, but I was outperforming their results by, by multiple magnitudes. And so everybody started asking, well, how are you doing that? That's when I started to teach them how to do YouTube ads to their funnels. And then that is really where ad outreach as it's known today comes in, where we have this done together process to work with clients to help them use YouTube ads to get consistent leads and sales working together. And that's kind of, you know, what, what that's the model that we still have to this day. Like what were some of those wrong decisions if there were any, like what were some of the mistakes you made? Oh, that's a, that, that is a great, um, that's a great question. So I, I actually have a great mistake. And I think that that's the thing is people don't really talk about and look at it. I see things as either a win and a success or a learning lesson. So when I started pivoting away from apps, so back when I was working with mobile apps, um, we were doing it full stack as like an agency approach. So actually I've got, I've got two different, not mistakes, but I would say I call them learning lessons. I mean, they're still you know kind of mistakes. One, one's actually more of a mistake. One's more of like a learning lesson. So we were kind of doing a full stack approach and we were working with app developers. And because I had app find and I could create app, you know, YouTube videos around mobile apps, I was really good at it. We would just create the videos and then we'd take that and we'd run that as an ad. So when we started pivoting away to like to funnels. Um, I made the mistake of thinking like, oh yeah, we could film videos for businesses. No problem. You know? Uh, and I remember uh, running, I, I remember, and it's actually kind of funny because this wasn't even a, because we were working with funnels and stuff. And I think we worked with an Amazon, F, somebody was teaching people how to sell on Amazon and we did a good job with that, you know, creating a video around that and doing these different things. We created a video, we worked with um, a uh, chemical manufacturer. I, no joke, this is hilarious, right? So I haven't told this story in a podcast yet, so you're getting an like a, a, a original here. Um, I was, uh, I, we were working with a chemical manufacturer and they were doing like 75 million a year. So they were a big chemical manufacturer. I remember flying out, uh, you know, to where their headquarters was negotiating a deal with the CEO, you know, of the company in their boardroom, um, selling them on YouTube ads and everything we we're going to do. And so, um, we filmed two videos. So we had an initial video that was filmed at a trade show and it was actually of their, person like demonstrating their chemicals and we targeted that we actually got like cost effective leads for this very complex b2b chemical like they're selling to manufacturers and i remember we were getting these manufacturers of like nuts and bolts and they're like these are perfect clients like these nuts and bolts like manufacturers hilarious so anyways they're doing this very complex b2b which is even you know more complex than some of the stuff we work with now which is kind of funny um, you know, some of the clients we have now, uh, with some exceptions, but, um, that video worked, but it was very natural and authentic video and it worked great. So like, all right, awesome. We want this professional video shot in our machine shop. So we go out to this machine shop and we're going to do an on location shoot. Also, we got our expenses totally wrong. We're now spending so much money to rent all this equipment to like 
drive out to this like shoot location. Like I was paying for my own flights out there. I was way undercharging for what we had. And we go to film and you know, I was I had I, I had never filmed on a machine shop floor, so I was like, oh these these lapel mics that I have and boom mic backups are gonna be perfect if there's all these machines going on in the background that are literally manufacturing equipment. You cannot, it is physically impossible to film in an active manufacturing, like, <laughs> building. It, like, it, it's ridiculous. So we were there, we filmed the whole thing, we're like, okay, we'll fix it in post. So we go back, and oh man, the whole thing was just, it was rough. And I remember going and presenting the video. And we already had this other video that was producing good results. And I remember them being so unhappy, like, so unhappy that we ended up having to refund them everything and eat all the costs of going like like not only developing the videos going out there um you know going to their trade show but flying out to visit them we paid for our own hotels so in the whole probably about ten thousand dollars uh on this client that we i think that originally would have made 15 like or or twenty thousand or something like that on, on this particular deal but undercharging for 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 what we were providing and um, yeah, so those were the mistakes, but that taught me a valuable lesson. It's like, my expertise is not in filming really amazing videos. I know what needs to be filmed, but I'm not a videographer. Like I'm not a professional videographer. There's people that have gone to school, you know, to be, you know, videographers, cinematographers, and now we work with people like that all the time. So the big lesson that I learned there is I don't need, and I'll actually piggyback that with another lesson that actually helped us get to the model we're at today. I don't need to do videos for people. I just need to show them what needs to be in their video. Because I, we had a great script. They love the script we wrote for them. And we still, we write scripts for our clients. We got multiple copyrights. They love the script. But the video itself, we just didn't have the technical know-how to, to reach this really ridiculous, you know, hill of, of filming a video in this manufacturing plant. And the other thing I combined with this so, so then we went to, okay, now we'll, we'll help people know, we'll help them write the scripts, but we'll refer them to other people to film, or we'll tell them to film it naturally. Because that other video worked out well for them. Um, you know, but they didn't want to use that video because they didn't think it was professional enough. Also, knowing what I know now, I would have actually gone back and said, no, you should use this video because it's authentic and it works because it's authentic. You don't need a super polished video. But in addition to that, the other thing is we then took that knowledge and started to do, um, you know, to have, uh, to script out videos, have people do videos themselves, teach them how to do it. Um, but we were still running the ad campaigns for clients. And what we realized is when we were doing that, there are two big problems. One problem though, is we weren't empowering the clients to know how the ads worked. And so we weren't able to work closely with them to like have them understand. So they weren't able to take this in house. And because we were doing all the work, we weren't really able to efficiently scale this model because I had to hire people who were really good at managing these campaigns and have a lot of people to actually get the quality results, which is so important to us. So I got disillusioned with the agency model and what I innovated was something better. So instead of doing videos for people, instead of doing the ads for people, we do it together. And that allows us to work with more clients and have a bigger impact, but that also allows our clients to get better results because we can actually work hands-on with clients charge them a fraction of what we would charge if we were to you know, actually do it for them, but that's not what they want anyways. What they want is they want the result. And the best way to get the result is to have somebody on their team, and if it's early on, it's them as a business owner. Later on, it might be um, somebody on their team, a marketing director, media buyer, but having somebody on their team who can eat, sleep, and breathe their ads, and then be trained by us and work with us. So we'll help them set it up, we'll help them write the scripts, We'll walk them through the process, but we're also showing them what we're doing so that they know what to look at, what buttons to press, what to monitor to ensure they're getting the best results long-term. So we're actually installing that knowledge in their business. So I'd say those are probably the two big learning lessons that we had that shape the model that we have today. So before diving deeper into YouTube ads and just the business model that you built, which seems like it's working out amazingly well, I'm hoping to ask a more personal question because you're journey, just like the time frame, reminds me a lot of my own journey. And I remember when I was like 19 years old, I had this disc golf company. 
I was terrified and I had so much imposter syndrome that I don't think I could have walked into a room with a CEO. Like you had just mentioned negotiating deals with literally a CEO. Were you always like the face of the business? Were you always this confident, even at 19 years old, that people are going to take you seriously, respect you? Because I remember for me, it was like, I don't want my face to be a part of this whatsoever because nobody's going to take a 19 year old seriously. So I'm just really curious personally, how you combated that, if at all. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was always, I was always very confident in, you know, how I was showing up, what I was doing. And I think that might also come from being, well, less the face, because AppFind is more the voice of AppFind uh, from a long, for a long time with the YouTube channel. So I think I definitely eased into it. So I had that kind of public persona there. And then on Ad Outreach, really being the face of this and going in, but I'm not going to lie, I mean, going in and saying, you know, going out to... The, the, you know this 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 company and selling you know 75 you know million dollar company like CEO on this uh, on this thing and, and and taking these calls and also taking the hits when you know it, like if, if like in those early days right before we knew what our model was you know with things that didn't work out as well and, and then you know changing things and stuff but always being that person and being confident I, I do think that that's something that I've had but what I will say is everybody has something that they're not confident in. So at that time, I don't know if you remember, but like I was, I was actually 50 pounds heavier than I am now. What I wasn't confident in is really how I looked. And that did, that was something like whenever I published a video or these ads, I'd be like, oh, you know, I kind of kind of like had that wince, you know, as I click publish because, you know, I, I, I hadn't learned how to manage my nutrition and, and go to the gym and some of these different things that I was doing, that I'm doing now, um, you know, and so, Everybody has something that they're not confident about. So even me, I was confident in what I knew as a business person, confident in going, you know, to these meetings, getting on sales calls, doing all these different things, being the face of the business. But the asterisk I would say is the thing I wasn't as confident in was how I looked. Um, and for a long time, I also saw my age as like a negative. So I wouldn't tell people my age. So I think similar to you, like I would try and hide it. I just... I wouldn't, I, I would show up confidently, but I wasn't confident that I was that age and showing up confidently, if you know what I mean. So I mm. wasn't upfront about it. Now I am upfront. So it's a big difference. Podcasts that I was on, even, you know, two, three years ago, I wouldn't say what my age was, but now I say it right at the beginning. Like, hey, I started out, you know, when I was 12, I'm 20 to you know, 25 now, et cetera, et cetera, because I know that actually it is a positive. It's a part of my story. People are going to be excited to see that. People are going to see themselves, you know, uh, if they are, you know, younger watching this or if they're not, it's going to say like, hey, like if I can do it, they can too. This question is a little bit more about like maybe listeners could, you know, based on the response, this question could think about this business a little more tangibly and kind of some of the inner workings who aren't familiar with, you know, how what's going on when they get served a YouTube ad. I feel like I get so many YouTube ads that are these just like, giant businesses that everyone already knows about these staples like Google Fi or a, you know, a Ford or whatever things that don't, for me, don't move the needle on the decision I'm going to make like a, things that large, like there's going to be more information go into it than me just in a YouTube ad. Now, if it was like some kind of camping equipment or a smaller thing, like something I hadn't heard of, like, I think I'm more likely to actually engage with that. So I guess what's going on there? Like, how do you get these type of businesses? I mean, I know some are very large, but if they're if they're smaller or more niche, how are you getting those in front of people? When I don't know, at least for me, I seem to just get these just giant companies that I've seen a million times. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, like I said, I'm not gonna cho choose my internet provider based on a YouTube ad. I'm not gonna choose a car I'm gonna buy based on my a YouTube ad. Now, like smaller things in life or more niche things, I might. But so I don't know if you could just kind of let us peek behind the curtain a little bit. It's actually a great question because there's two types of ads uh, or not ads, but there's two types of marketing campaigns that you could do on YouTube and really just marketing campaigns in general. There's branding, which is what you're talking about, right? So like Google getting out there, Coca-Cola getting out there, Ford, Geico. And that's what it was really early on. It was like almost all branding. So those are branding campaigns. On the other side, you have direct response. That's where you are advertising with the purpose to get somebody to click and buy. Uh, or click and take action. So become a lead, uh, book a strategy call, phone call, um, you know, whatever that next step is, right? That's what we specialize in. Now, we have helped brands that are on the branding side, but that's like a little bit more rare. And some are in between. So one of our clients early on was Tuft & Needle, and they had both the branding and direct response component. 
uh, which is actually a lot of the, those mattress companies you see, one of the reasons they're so successful is they're big enough brands that they can do branding, but they also are enough of a pul- uh, like kind of impulse purchase if you're in the position and need to buy it, but they can also be direct response. So mm-hmm. Some things have both, but we really specialize in this direct response. You mentioned hiking equipment, right? The other thing is, um, you know, uh, courses or personal development. So uh, some listeners may be familiar, you might be familiar with Bob Proctor and Proctor Gallagher Institute, uh, unfortunately passed away recently, but they're still you know, selling his courses and his mindset, similar to Tony Robbins. Um, but Bob Proctor himself uh, in, his, or in his company, uh, you know, one of our clients that we have, one of, you know, one of the clients that we work with, and um, they're going for direct response. They want somebody to sign up, sign up for a webinar, um, learn that they can unlock this potential in themselves to grow, um, start, you know, learning about uh, some of these principles and then um, in personal development and then, you know, buy a course or invest in a program or talk to a coach um, and go through that process. And obviously we have a lot of different people. I'm just using kind of bigger examples that people may or may not know of, of clients that we that we have. But um, but there could also be some of these like small I- I- independent you know products or individual consultants or coaches, people teaching people how to invest in real estate. Uh, I know Cody, you mentioned you're doing, you know, Airbnb investing, some of these different things. I'm sure those, those were, you know, people on podcasts and stuff. But we have clients that teach people how to, uh, you know, invest in real estate or how to invest in Airbnbs or set up an Airbnb company. We've got clients that teach people how to sell on Amazon. Um, we also have clients that are selling individual products. We have clients that are, you know, that have SaaS companies, right? So wide variety, um, but most of the clients that we have, like 90 to 95 percent are after direct response. They want to spend a dollar and make, you know, I mean, really, they usually want to spend a dollar, make four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollars back. Um, But at the very least, even if you could just turn a dollar into two dollars, and I'd say the average is probably around four or five X, right? So you turn a dollar into like four or five, you know, six dollars. But even just turning a dollar into two dollars, you are making a return on that ad spend today. You're making a return on that ad spend immediately. Now, obviously, there's other things involved. There's diminishing returns. That's why it's, it's not an infinite money glitch. You can't, you know, like do, do immediately spend a billion dollars and make two billion dollars. But you can find where are the economies of scale that I can have where I can spend a dollar and make four or five dollars or I can spend a dollar in e-commerce, maybe spend a dollar, and make two dollars. Right. Where can I do that? How can I scale that up? And that, I think, is 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 the key versus most companies don't have the luxury of doing those branding campaigns, especially the ones that we work with. I think we do have quite a number of entrepreneurs who listen to our show who probably have not ventured into YouTube ads yet. And quite frankly, I haven't really gotten too deep into YouTube ads. I've played around a little bit, but I'm not an expert by any means. What are some calls to action, or I guess, what was the exact language you used to, you know, direct response, but you just, you want someone to take action on something. What are some that work really well for, you know, beginners in this space who just kind of want to get their feet wet with YouTube ads? Yeah, we have found that there is a simple three part framework to every high converting YouTube ad. And that it, it goes like this. It's, it's very simple. It's hook, you pull people in, hook, educate, provide genuine value on the ad. This is what most people miss. And then call to action. So hook, educate, call to action. You pull people in with the hook. So you want to capture their attention, bring them in. Um, I'll give you an example in a second. Then educate. This is where you want to provide value. We call it golden nuggets. What's a golden nugget? It's small. So again, this isn't supposed to be a super long ad. It's small, but incredibly valuable. It's literally worth its weight in gold, right? So you're giving them a golden nugget in that educate section. And then you have a call to action to get them off of that video into your funnel or to purchase your product or to become a lead or to book a call or whatever that next step is. So hook, educate, call to action. So an example of ours, you know, we'll have a hook that um, the first one, it it kind of is a pattern interrupt and us versus them. Um, Then it states a problem and then tells them I've got the solution. Listen to this. Try to listen for all three components in this hook. YouTube ads beat Facebook ads every time. Let's face it. Facebook ad costs are going through the roof. And even when you have a great ad, they're almost impossible to scale. In this video, I'm gonna show you how you can scale your business to seven or even eight figures using YouTube video ads, just like the one you're watching right now. Wow, and, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> so, I, said that I said that a few times, but you can see this. It's like, it, so even within the hook, there's three parts. There's, there's the pattern interrupt. YouTube ads beat Facebook ads every time. If you're running Facebook ads, 
you're going to say, whoa, 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 I got to pay attention. Even if you disagree with me, you're going to start paying attention. You're going to be receptive to what I'm saying. You're not going to click skip. Then from there, I'm going to outline the problem that they're facing, which helps me tee up the solution, which is Facebook ad costs are going through the roof. And then the other thing I know is what are the two biggest problems people have with Facebook ads? Either the costs are going up or they can't scale their good campaigns they already have. So, and even when you have a great campaign, they're almost impossible to scale. And then I say, in this video, I'm going to show you exactly how you can use uh, YouTube ads, just like one you're watching right now, scale your business seven, eight figures or variation on that. And then I'm, I've got the, the value. But here's the key. You have to actually deliver on the ad. If I just said that in this video, I'm going to show you this. So go register for my webinar. People are going to be like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, he's, you know, another webinar. But if I then spend two minutes showing them some of my best YouTube ad strategies and why YouTube's better and some of the value of what you can do on YouTube, which is what I do. I say, let's hop over to my computer screen. Then I show them what they can target on YouTube, outline a little bit of my 3D targeting strategy, give them value. And then I say, all right, so now that you've seen just how powerful, so I give them the value, I show my screen, I say, now that you've seen just how powerful YouTube ads can be, I want to invite you to sign up for my full training, my full webinar, where I'm gonna show you in depth exactly how this works. I'm gonna go for a full hour, just like I showed you here. I'm gonna go deep, walk you through how to craft the perfect YouTube ad, how to target the right people, what to do, how to scale it, click register, and I'll see you on the webinar. So I pulled people in, I've stated their problem, I told them what they're gonna get, I deliver value, I give them a golden nugget, educate in the video, and then I have a clear and concise call to action to get them off of that video and into my webinar. We're gonna provide more value, get them on a strategy call, so phone call, then on the phone call, we do a consultation. And on a consultation, we get them to become a full client if it's a good fit. I love that tangible example and like walking us through the components and then, you know, even like the subcomponents within that and like how it's not just you hopping on a screen and saying some things. Like it is very scripted, it's very thought out, it's scientific. And I know we earlier reclassified mistakes as, as learning moments, learning opportunities. But like, what are things that maybe you've seen, especially these? smaller like like cody said you know we have a lot of, a lot of listeners who are entrepreneurs probably not too many who are running something like tough needle though right like smaller places yeah oh yeah when, when they're when they're getting these things started what are some of those uh those mistakes that they've made or some of those things they could learn oh yeah and we've got clients of, of all sizes too and so i i use those because they're kind of bigger examples you might be familiar with but um you know like one of the big things is just the ads themselves so just making sure that you follow that hook educate call to action but when it comes to the targeting, let's say you get that, you got a great ad, you got that all under, under, you know, you created it. Remember, it doesn't have to be overly produced. Remember the lesson I showed, told you, I tried to overly produce that ad in those early days and it, it fell on its face. Even if we pulled it off, we got all the audio fixed. That ad likely would not have converted as well as the ad where I just had a gimbal on my phone recording the salesperson at the trade show. Why? Because it's natural and authentic. Now you still wanna have the hook, educate, call to action. Some people think, they hear me say natural, authentic, they're like, oh, I can just say whatever I want. That's not true, you wanna follow this format. <laughs> However, you can follow that format. You literally take your phone, you take this device uh, called a gimbal, you get it for like 150 bucks on Amazon, and it can stabilize your phone, and you record yourself, and you can film an ad, or you can have somebody else hold the gimbal. If you want a professional camera, by all means, you can do it, but you don't need much more than, than your phone and, and something to stabilize it, make it a little bit more professional, and you're good to go. In terms of the targeting, the biggest mistake people make is treating YouTube ads like Facebook ads. So in Facebook ads, you can only target in two dimensions, right? So you could target somebody based on demographics, so where they're located, age, gender, parental status, some of these you know basic demographic details, and then you combine it with, um, with interest. So what they like, the pages, all the different things. But what are you missing in that? What you're missing is intent. You're missing time. Are you reaching people at the right time? What happens if you reach the right person with the ability to buy, but at the wrong time? Well, they're not necessarily gonna take action. You're not gonna get that direct response we talked about. That's the problem with Facebook. People are just scrolling through. So you might be the perfect person for somebody to reach, but if they get you at the wrong time, when you're not ready to actually take action, it's just gonna be another impression that they paid for. Versus on YouTube, there's something powerful that we can do. Not just target it based on demographics and layer that with the videos that they're watching or the keywords of the videos that they're watching, which um, is, a, and I'll get into that in a second, we actually made a software to help you find the best you know, keywords for your YouTube ads targeting. But then you're layering that with, with who, well, well, you're layering who somebody is with the videos they're watching. Sorry, 
just to go back on YouTube, people are like, oh great, I can target videos individually. So they'll only target videos and demographics. So now what they're doing, I, I forgot to mention this part. So they'll target in two dimensions as well, but two different dimensions. They'll target demographics. So does somebody have the ability to buy? And then they'll target intent, so the timing. So they'll say, I wanna target these videos, these keywords. But the problem is they might not reach the right person. So what happens if you reach uh, somebody with the ability to buy at the right time? Well, what happens is you um, is, is you get a window shopper, right? So you have somebody who goes into the store, but they're not the right person, so they're never actually gonna make a purchase. What you want is to reach the right person with the ability to buy at the right time. My Siri keeps popping up here. Uh, so reach the right person with the ability to buy at the right time for your ads to convert. That's layering demographics with the intent, with the video targeting, that's time, and the interest and audience and affinities, who that person is. You're layering all three of those together. That is the key. And so that's what we help our clients do is this 3D YouTube ads targeting. Layering the right person with the ability to invest at the right time. Demographics, uh, so, so layering, well, audience is interest, the right person. Demographics is ability to invest. And then the video targeting is at the right time. Awesome. Now, seriously, I love how you're kind of just laying everything out like step by step. I think it's going to be really helpful for people to at least just get started looking into YouTube ads. And I know you have a bunch of free content. You have a whole team doing this. Before we do let you go, I do want to ask, because before we hit record, you were talking about acquisitions and billion dollar ideas. So don't want to let you just skate away without talking about that a bit and what your what your goals are for just everything you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So really expanding here into this next iteration. So the big picture, I'll start with the big picture goal and then some of the things we're doing to, to put that in place. So the big picture goal here is I'm looking to build a, a billion dollar company and, and honestly corporation, because what I've really found is ad outreach, um, I can see a clear vision to scale it to hundred million. So right now we're doing over eight figures. We're doing about one to 1.5 million a month. Uh, we're looking to scale it up to 3 million a month as the next step of the 36 and then, and then scale that up to hundred million uh, a year. Um, but I also see a way to build a billion dollar business that is ad ventures capital. That's the next step that I have, which is acquiring, investing in, scaling, and then either keeping for cash flow as a flywheel or exiting other companies within an entity based around our marketing acumen and expertise that creates a flywheel that can scale up and create a billion dollar company. And that is the next step that I have. And it's gonna be a collection of you know, info-based businesses, right? So some of these like info things, but also combined with uh, SaaS and e-commerce and other online businesses. So it's online businesses that I can scale using the knowledge that I have and, uh, and that we have as a team and that we're gonna continue to grow as a team. And so we've already took, taken steps in that direction. So we've already created our own SaaS software, keywordsearch.com. So it's a YouTube uh, keyword research tool. So if you wanna find all the best YouTube keywords to target your ads in front of, you know, we created a tool for that. And then also now it has YouTube ad spot. So you know how Facebook ads has like an ad library there's also tools that are ad spy. There's not really anything like that for YouTube. And there, there's a couple small things, but they only scratch the surface of what's possible. We created a YouTube ad spy tool within keywordsearch.com where you can actually go in and find all of the different YouTube ads that are running that we've scraped um, that are unlisted ads. You wouldn't otherwise be able to see them. Top ones for your industry. And then actually go in and we've created an algorithm that can find and spy on the exact keywords that they're likely targeting based on what where we see their ads showing up, which is really powerful. And so we're building this database that's powering our clients, but it's also a SaaS that anybody can go and sign up for and either get a trial or, or create an account there. And so we're, we're building a SaaS play as well. Uh, I got my own e-commerce brand too. Uh, it's it's uh, L Gear, it's like an iPhone, you know, kind of charging, like charging stand thing. Oh, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like charging. Anyways, you can't really see it here. But it's like a charging stand, charge your iPhone and your AirPods at the same time. And, um, and, uh, and then what we're also doing is I also uh, have made my first acquisition, which is really exciting. So uh, I can't announce the exact uh, company that we've acquired yet because we haven't done the PR launch yet, um, but we have inked the deal, which is exciting. So we did our first acquisition for a company um, that serves coaches, consultants, course creators, teaching them how to scale their businesses. Well, we help a lot of people who are coaches, consultants, course creators, and other businesses too, but we help them scale using YouTube ads at next level. And so all of the people in this business is one of our clients. They went through our YouTube ads a program and process. They scaled their business to 2.5 million, um, you know, off of 300, 400 thousand dollars of ad spend. So uh, nice, nice return there. 
and they're just looking to do other things. I think they have their, they actually have their own SaaS company now. So they said, hey, we want to sell the business to you. So we've just acquired the business. We've acquired their you know, 16,000 plus people that they have. And um, we're going to be going in and uh, you know, transitioning people to our programs, to our process, saying, hey, if you're looking to scale and grow, um, building on everything that they've helped you build, we're going to help you take it to that next level and take really good care of the clients and the um, and the uh, different people that they have. And that's another thing is we're now going into these acquisitions. And so, you know, especially somebody who's listening right now, um, if you have a business that you're looking to potentially exit um, or do some type of strategic partnership, that could be a good opportunity. And, you know, my, my, my doors are open to opportunities like that. <laughs> well, Alec, it's been a an awesome, you know, time having you here. We really appreciate you making the time. I mean, going from a 12 year old with an iPod touch to a 25 year old with a $10 million run rate business is a pretty <laughs> incredible transformation. I'm sure it's all thanks to the teachings that Cody gave you back in college. Um, but, <laughs> but I know you got a lot left to teach our audience members. And so if they want to keep up with your journey, like find those resources, where's the best place for them to come out and, you know, find you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So honestly, uh, one of the best places is if you go to adoutreach.com, uh, A-D-O-U-T-R-E-A-C-H.com, adoutreach.com slash gift. Uh, I put together a gift just because you're listening to this podcast. I've got some of my best resources there. We've got our YouTube ads webinar that's going to show you exactly how to set this up, like a 60 minute. And, and it's all about value. Same way I say you got to lead your ads with value. Um, we want to lead that with value in that, uh, in that webinar. Um, we also have our $200 million YouTube ads PDF. It's a 19 page PDF, shows our exact process for YouTube ads, step-by-step, step, all of that within the PDF. Um, that's another free resource as well. We've got our Facebook group that you can join um, to kind of connect with other people who are looking to scale YouTube ads. Uh, you can book a strategy call if you're, if you're looking to really learn, 45 minute complimentary call. And then also we're posting videos on YouTube. So you can find us everywhere there. Adoutreach.com slash gift is a great hub check out all the resources that we have. I want to provide as much value as possible. Awesome, man. Well, we will link all of that up in the show notes and you know, all the listeners can find all the different places that you are on the internet. And I'm sure that's going to be ever expanding. And yeah, seriously, just want to thank you for the time today, Alaric. It's been a lot of fun catching up. I've been seeing you just blowing up on LinkedIn. I'm like, I haven't talked to this guy in years since the OIM 210 back at UMass Amherst, but now we are full circle. So seriously, thank you for making the time today and giving our audience so much value. Awesome. I, I love it. Thank you so much, Cody. It's been awesome reconnecting with you as well. I remember the, the early days and now it's, it's coming back full circle. And Justin, great meeting you as well. And hopefully I provide a ton of value here. And yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. Okay.